And welcome back, everybody. I'm joined by broadcaster Gary Thorne. You've probably heard him in video games, NHL, Major League Baseball. Um, and now he's teaching at Arizona State's Walter Cronkite School of Journalism. He's back teaching at the Cronkite School, teaching live sports play-by-play. Mr. Gary Thorne, it's an honor. Thank you for joining me. My, my pleasure. Good to see you again. So I, I want to ask, you know, since I took your class in the spring and you're teaching it again, um, broadcasting has changed a lot across all sports, a lot more stats, analytics, uh, saber metrics. Um, where would you say the state of live sports broadcasting is right now? And how has that changed the way broadcasters like yourself prepare and do their games? I don't think there's any question that broadcasting is in a state of great flux and tremendous change at this point in time from just about every angle. I mean, the presentation, the platforms are changing, whether we're going from, you know, it used to be the, the networks carried the games or your local regional carried them. And now we're talking about streaming and Apple and every other conceivable kind of presenting um, a sports event. So that's really changed. Uh, the pandemic's created a whole new situation of games being done from somebody's basement or somebody's uh, studio or from an empty ballpark or stadium when you're not actually at the game as it's being played. Uh, that's an entirely new arrangement. And there's a real question about how much of that will continue after the pandemic ends, which will change the face of broadcasting. Uh, and the, the presentation of even more information, the analytical part of it in particular, is changing the face of broadcasting for every sport that's done. There's far more research that has to be done, far more uh, technical presentations of uh, what's going on in the game and why it happens and what all of the analytics say as to whether it should or should not be going that way. So it's, it's, a, it's a completely uh, 180 degree change, I think, in this business. Uh, and where it ends up, we don't know. Um, when the pandemic finally uh, comes to a conclusion, hopefully, uh, we're going to see where we end up. But a lot of people believe there's not going to be much of a change as far as going out to live games to broadcast from, and that uh, maybe announcers go and production crews don't. Maybe nobody goes, and we continue to do games from the cellar. Uh, it's it's a changing world, and as far as play by play is concerned, is that the main difference? You, you broke in in 1985 with the Mets. Um, is the amount of numbers and the amount of information is that the main change that you've seen over your time in the business? Yeah, I think that's fair to say. Um, uh, certainly, yeah, for baseball, that's. When I broke in, we were, there were two things we focused on. One was doing the game and bringing the play by play. And since I started doing it in radio, uh, obviously you're following every play and everything that's happening. Uh, and then the second thing was storytelling that we were able to tell stories about the teams, the players, the coaches, the managers that were involved. And we had time to do that. Um, a lot of that second part, the story part has been replaced by analytics where we now have, uh, present an analytical number and have to explain it because even now you can't assume that fans know, uh, you know, what a weighted average means, uh, uh, replacement value. I mean, all the things that we talk about now, you have to give a definition to it, then you have to give the number and then you got to explain why it matters. And that changes the context of what a play-by-play -play announcer does. And there's going to be more of that coming in. And I think it is, it's probably the greatest uh, change that we've had in the game since I started doing it. Was there a difficult scenario that you ran into as the, as the sports that self are evolving and how broadcasting has evolved to where you realize that this is how it's going to be? I have to be the one that adjusts here. Yeah, I think that's, yeah, there's a constant adjustment that goes on in, in every sport. Uh, for a play-by-play -play announcer. Uh, there wasn't any particular point that that happened. Uh, it's just, it, it's been, a, it's the growing vine uh, and it's continued to grow in terms of analytics. So you recognize what they are and now you got to think about them. I mean, we didn't even, we didn't think about analytics even though 
RBIs and runs scored and ERA, they are analytics. And right. we've used them in baseball forever. But we just never thought of them in those terms. So now we add new numbers and you've got to think about how you're going to present those. Why do they matter to this game? And what are the numbers that do matter? I mean, it just throwing out uh, a bucket full of numbers doesn't do anything. In, in fact, I think it detracts from a broadcast. You've got to select what matters for this particular team or player, make the point, say why it matters. And uh, that takes up a good deal of your play-by-play time. I want to go into a couple of unique moments that you were able to experience. Uh, Sunday is going to be the 32nd anniversary of the Loma Prieta earthquake uh, in San Francisco, actually centered in Santa Cruz. You were in San Francisco at Candlestick Park working with ABC for that series. Um, you know, in this age, we have cell phones, internet, social media, we have all this. But back then, that wasn't the case. Um, I, I want you to, to describe for me what that moment was like, what those days were like, because again, with no, with nothing that we have today, there's a lot of uncertainty surrounding that series. Nonetheless, it's a world series between the two teams that are in that regional area. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, certainly it was, uh, to say a memorable event would be to sure change it a good deal. It was a tragedy because there, there were deaths involved. Um, but I was on the field uh, with Willie Mays and Joe Morgan. We were in a commercial break on ABC. And the next thing that was going to go on the air was uh, Joe and I interviewing Willie outside the San Francisco uh, dugout at Candlestick. And it was uh, the commercial had just ended. It had just returned. The broadcast had just returned to the ballpark. Al Michaels was just getting ready to throw it down to us when the earthquake happened. So that's where we were. I had never been through an earthquake before. Uh, the sound was of a huge train coming at you. Um, and immediately uh, Joe recognized what it was because Joe lived out in Oakland at the time. So he'd been through a couple and said, we're having an earthquake. And then the next thing you know, the ground literally was rolling underneath you. And I looked up candlestick, they had these huge cement awnings that came out over the stands huge cement slabs, tons and tons of it. And they were waving in the air like this all around the top of the ballpark. Fortunately, I think there was only one that actually crashed and it came in the outfield area and it was still early. So a lot of people were not in their seats at that time. Uh, and uh, players came out on the field uh, trying to get their families out of the stands to get them down onto the field and safety or just to get with their families. And the chance started up at Candlestick of play ball because we didn't realize the extent of the, uh, the nature of this earthquake. So some of the fans wanted the, you know, the game to start and go on. Um, we got back on the air and I became a reporter on the field at that point because I was the one down on the field and I interviewed the commissioner, I interviewed the fire chief, I interviewed the rescue squad people. And then we started getting reports of just how extensive the damage was, the uh, bridge that had collapsed uh, downtown San Francisco where there was a lot of damage to buildings where electricity had been lost. Uh, there were fires because of gas main breaks. And suddenly, not suddenly, but pretty quickly began to realize this is really serious. This isn't just an earthquake that's come and gone. This is an earthquake that's left a lot of damage behind. Uh, so that's what that's what happened. And then we, uh, for the rest of the week, we were shut down, of course, for a number of days. Um, ABC asked me to stay in San Francisco. There was no electricity. There was no running water. Uh, the hotel was great in taking care of us. Uh, with flashlights and water bottles brought to your door every day. The commissioner held uh, candlelight press conferences at the St. Francis Hotel for the days uh, that we weren't playing in order to bring people up to date on what the plans were, because there were obvious discussions about canceling the World Series, just ending it. Then they decided, no, we'll go forward with it and, and finish it out as soon as we can, which is what, which is what happened. Uh, but it was... A obviously a very traumatic experience 
and one hopefully that uh, you know nobody has to go through again. Another unique World Series 2001. We just came up on the 20th anniversary of 9/11. Lots of moving tributes, uh, especially with that spotlight of Mets Yankees game at City Field. Um, and you have this really the the series, one of the best World Series uh, of all of all time. I mean, you have the Diamondbacks, every home team winning. Um, you have the Jeter walk off in Game Four, um, and you have President Bush coming to Game Three, I believe, right, and throwing out the first pitch. I mean, talk about a, a baseball moment that's absolutely going to live forever. Yeah, uh, again, it's the it's the tragedy of the moment that created the opportunity for the space to be filled, um, and and it was. Again, there were discussions about whether or not the season should even go on. Do you shut everything down? Uh, how do you get back into playing a game in light of the disaster that's occurred? And uh, the belief uh, that it was important to get back to playing games again, just as a relief for the public uh, in general, uh, to, to have some kind of normalcy return was the, was the feeling as far as baseball was concerned by the by MLB executives and by teams. And I think by most players, uh, they felt it was important to get to get back and just do something that would give give fans a chance to to do something other than, you know, to continue to hear about the tragedy and what the results have been. So that creates the moment and uh, that creates history. Just as the earthquake situation did, so did so did 9-11 create that kind of opportunity and the game became important uh, for the teams to play and the uh, Piazza home run that was celebrated and has become a piece of baseball history with the Mets. Uh, those are, I mean, they're tough. They're tough times for everybody involved because you don't want to overreact. You don't want, you know, look, the game may be important, but it sure as hell isn't the most important thing that's going on right now. And it really becomes just a, goes back to what it originally was a form of entertainment for a moment's peace in, in a time of great tragedy. And I think it was handled really well uh, by everybody, particularly by the players. I thought their response, it was solemn, but they played, they played the game and they played the game hard, but they didn't take it to any level where it uh, didn't recognize that it was simply a little piece mm -hmm. that was being put into play while the, uh, while the tragedy unfolded. Yeah, and it's great that sports can be that field to bring people together and like you said, entertain people and bring that uh, relief to people. Uh, I want to get to a couple of uh, famous moments that you were on the mic for. Um, I think you know where I may be going with this first one. Uh, coming up on the 10 year anniversary of it next February, uh pete weber wins his fifth u.s open championship <laughs> yes there you go that's right so i went and watched there's a youtube video of pete weber versus the fans i had never seen this before and it's him talking back to this fan now you had told our class that you know he was talking to somebody and then all i saw was his his outburst at the end um which was so you know went viral um but he was going back and forth with this lady did you guys ever find out who that was you ever spot him because i know you guys are talking about it um that just had to have been a crazy sequence of events a crazy match yeah that was really uh it, it was funny i mean there was a uh, a woman who was a fan who was watching and she wasn't being outrageous or anything but she was heckling pete a little bit during the course of the of the bowling uh match and uh he had he started, you know, responding to her. Pete's great at that. Pete's a great showman, number one. But although I, I, this wasn't all show, I think he really, he really felt uh, the fan getting under his skin a little bit, uh, and, and was talking to her. And then when he finished up and won, you know, he just, he just let it all out. And uh, it was, it was a great moment. It was funny to hear. Uh, it was great to watch, and. Pete, I think, in, in after this in later years, has has said that he almost didn't know what he was saying or who he was saying it to <laughs> at that point. That he was celebrating the win, and and it, it all just came out 
uh, of him without a lot of thought about it. It was just a reaction to the moment, to what had been going on with this fan throughout the match, and he just let it go. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'm amazed by by how many times this gets repeated and gets aired and has been viewed on YouTube. Uh, at the time, I don't think we realized it was going to become this piece of bowling history, uh, but it has, and, it, and it's fun to watch. Over 6 million views on YouTube, <laughs> and it just, I laugh every time when he just goes, who do you think you are? I am. I am. Whatever that means. <laughs> <laughs> right? And he's just letting her know, I am. I am. So, that's uh, great. Um, another another. In- interesting moment when you did your master's voice with adam jones at the play i mean that was just awesome was that was that kind of like you realize there's no fans in the ballpark of course pre-covid we weren't used to it you certainly weren't and are you just going out there and saying like in in a break or are you saying i'm gonna do my best master's voice for the next batter no no really no i never thought about it in advance uh well, Jim Palmer and I were doing the game and it was an empty stadium, completely quiet. We'd never done a game like that before. There had never been a game like that before. And it just, when Adam came up, it just struck me at that moment. I hadn't thought about it before. It struck me at that moment that it was so quiet. But I said, you know, this is like we're being at the Masters here and waiting for somebody to tee off. And <laughs> uh, this is how it would sound if we were doing it in the Masters voice. Why? But it, it was instantaneous. I hadn't, it wasn't planned. I hadn't thought about it before. I hadn't said anything to Jim about doing it. And uh, then, of course, Adam hits the ball all the way to the wall. And, uh, and, I, just, and, and I just did it that way, trying to, uh, trying to add a little light to a ball game that, again, was in a circumstance right. that was difficult in light of the... Uh, in light of what had gone on in downtown Baltimore in the days before and a couple of canceled games. Uh, so it was just a moment. No, nope, there wasn't any planning for it. It just happened. And then I, I like this. Uh, I'm not going to s- make you sit through the barrage of home runs by Glaber Torres, but I <laughs> like the authenticity that you, it seems like that, that went on during that run. I think he hit 13 home runs against the Orioles that year in 2019. And it's just like, Okay, he hit a home run. Now he's hit two. Now he's at three. Now he's at four. And then it's just you just slowly the life just seems to come out of the booth as he keeps going on. And I mean, is that I mean, in in reality, is that a broadcasting lesson that I mean, you, it's okay to be human. You don't have to kind of be you know in robot broadcasting mode all the time. Well, I hope so. Add, you can light it up. You know, yeah. occasionally when you have a crazy scenario with what happened. Uh, Gary Thorne versus Glaber Torres. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, I hope so. I mean, I've always, you just believe you be yourself in every situation at all times in doing sports broadcast. Uh, I don't believe in trying to be somebody else. You can't survive. It's too many words. It's too many hours. It's too much time on the air. You just be yourself, be natural, do things that, you know, like that, that just come to mind at the time. Uh, say what's on your mind, talk about with the experiences, uh, uh, history and numbers, whatever it may be, but be natural about it. And uh, with Torres, it just got to the point of unbelievability. And that was honestly, that's the way I felt. It was like, what the hell's going on? How can this go on? He, every time he came to the plate, he was just destroying Orioles pitching. And it wasn't so much cheering for the Orioles at the, at that point, as it was, I couldn't believe it. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was like every time he came up, you were going, is it possible? Can he do this again? I mean, and he did. And then you were like, oh my God, how can this, how can he, how can this be happening? But that's what sports are all about. I mean, you live for the moments that are different and unique and historical. And Torres in his season against the Orioles was was having that kind of a year. And all I did was act naturally it's the same way i would have reacted if i had been sitting down in the stands as a fan i would have had the same reaction that i had broadcasting the game yeah it was genuine it was authentic which i think a lot of people like um and yeah that was great i just love when paul O'Neill came in and you're just basically tell him go back to your own booth 
<laughs> that was great. And it was, everyone had a lot of fun with it. So, uh, and, and I know social media did as well. Um, I want to cram uh, two quick, well, I don't know if they're quick, but I'm going to try and cram two questions into one since I know you have to go. Um, analytics in baseball. Do, do, do you see it coming to a point where, I don't want to say it's ruining the game, but it's taking over the game to a point where we're not even sure what product we see nowadays and, and where the, does Major League Baseball have an impact on this going into the CBA negotiations this offseason? I doubt if it'll be, there are too many other issues in the CBA, so I doubt there'll be much said about it. And I think uh, analytics in the game is still trying to find its place. So I think what we've got is we've got this up curve on the use of analytics in games, and it's going to level off and it's going to come down a little bit as we're, we're going to find the ones that fit, the ones that work, the ones that make sense uh, as far as broadcasts are concerned. The analytics, as far as being written about and being available online and whatever, they're, they're going to be there. They'll continue to be expanded. But the use of them, I think, will level off so we get to a plateau of where we get, still have the storytelling. The game is still what's most important. And we put in what analytics fit to add to the broadcast. That's where I think we're going to go with that. And it's going to be very interesting to see what happens this off season. And I will say um, your call of Pete's moment, a strike to claim it has been sort of a mantra here at Cronkite. So uh, <laughs> I, it's, it's said a lot. So um, I guess congratulations on producing Good. such a great call. So <laughs> Gary, thank you so much for joining I me. Pleasure, really. Mike. Yeah, I really appreciate it. And uh, maybe we'll see you back on the mic sometime soon. Never know. You just right. never know. All right. Well, <laughs> well, you're teaching in the meantime. So that's uh, that's good stuff. Gary, thanks again. Thank appreciate you. It. Have a great one. All righty. Take care.